Hello, everyone. Thanks for waking up early and attending this talk on Saturday morning. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, can you hear me at the back? Yes? OK, cool. Um, so there's no sound system. This is only for recording, in case you're wondering. Um, so my name is Guillaume Taka. I work at Colabra, and this talk is about kernel CI. So I, I had a talk last year already about kernel CI. It was them. This is kind of an update on what things have happened in the past year, uh, but also about the future, really. Um, so what is the purpose of kernel CI in case you haven't, in case you're not familiar with the project and also what it wants to achieve in the longer term? So it's kind of climbing a big tall mountain really without trying to um, reach the point where kernels are released without bugs um, and uh, you know have a, at least quality control so we know which bugs are in the kernel um, and extending test coverage um, this, and also having reusable re tools. So the idea is to uh, test the upstream kernel, but anyone using the kernel in their own downstream environment should be able to reuse uh, these tools. Um, we now have an official mission statement <laughs> as written here. So that's basically what I'm trying to <laughs> explain here. But this is like the official word we have now. So people spend some time making, it, making this up, so I thought it deserved a, at least a slide here. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, <coughs> last year I said uh, maybe it will become a Linux Foundation project and this has happened. So in October, um, Kernel CI has become a new uh, project of the Linux Foundation with all the members listed here. So Colabra, Bailey, Bray, Red Hat, Google, Microsoft, Fan Result, IO, and Civil Infrastructure Platform, which is another Linux Foundation uh, project. Uh, now we're still in the early days of you know what does that actually mean for the project. So you know we have a mission statement, <laughs> the first step. Uh, we have a budget and some stickers, uh, but there's a lot of other things coming soon, hopefully. Um, <coughs> there's a website also, um, a part of the website ex explaining uh, what that means for the project. Uh, so although it has become a Linux Foundation project, the, the aim is still to be really community oriented. So of course there are things that are done by the members for the members, but it's really uh, to facilitate uh, things to happen for the kernel community at large. So we're still focused on upstream completely. I mean the tool again can be reused for other things. So if Red Hat wants to test a Fedora kernel, they can do that. Or maybe the project will help make it happen as an example. But it's still about testing the mainline kernel, upstream kernel. Um, and it's still about sending email reports to mailing lists um, and engaging, engaging more with subsystem maintainers and developers in general um, to basically help people um, add their own tests to kernel CI. A lot of, well, every subsystem has different workflows and some maintainers have created their own small CI, which works perfectly well for them probably but then uh, they might be reinventing some wheel and also not have access to all the hardware that kernel CI provides. So anyway, that's the kind of consolidation this, uh, that, that is um, the main, ob main objective we're trying to achieve. So <coughs> one um, kind of philosophy behind kernel CI um, is what we call the open testing philosophy. Because you know there's only one mainline kernel, so in the same way that people from many different origins, from many different reasons, contribute to the same code base, the Linux kernel. You know, when kernel 5.4 is released, that's 5.4 that's going to run on a, on a supercomputer, on an Android phone, or on, on anything. It's the same kernel, the same code base, although it does a lot of different things. So the reason why there are so many different test systems is because of these different use cases. But we could also have um, a common way of at least sharing the results, because some tests are relevant to all of these uh, cases. Uh, if we want to like test for memory leaks in the kernel, you can do that in it, you know, wherever the kernel is running. Um, so everybody is doing their own product tests, but this, 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 the idea is to have, um, have a test system that allows people to contribute their tests and contribute their hardware in the same way that they contribute the code. Um, <coughs> so yeah, like I said, so yeah, there's a large number of contributors. Um, so yeah, basically that's the, what I'll explain here. Um, the image is trying to say that we should try to like have um, the same surface of between tests and the code. So it's a bit like test coverage if you want, but like align the two things, like the whole idea of having open source development and having open source, open source testing, open testing on top of it basically. Um, now, how do you achieve that? So this is uh, like an abstract 
pipeline exp explaining how kernel CI works. For all of, all of these blocks, there is at least one implementation, but you could have different things for each of them, different instances. So um, let's start from the beginning. So you have a developer in the top left corner, so someone <coughs> writing some code. Um, so the code ends up as patches. Kernel CI doesn't test patches directly at the moment, but that's, it can be done. Other systems do it. Um, or Git branches, then of course it gets built. The purple arrows are like when files and results are pushed to, then you have you know, build artifacts. And after that, um, when you have a build, you can run test and then process the results to detect when there was a regression um, or basically see what needs to be reported from the results. Uh, and then your results are stored and analyzed to be able to then provide a, a report to the people and uh, the developers. And this is when the loop is closed. It's like an, um, it's a bit like an, in automation when you, the objective is to have a working kernel. <laughs> you know, like if you try to automate the, um, uh, um, uh, an arm, for example, uh, like a mechanical arm, you want to know where in which position it's going to be. If it's completely open and you just move something and you don't really look at it, you can guess where it's going. But if you have some sensors that will actually know where it is and you know the angle of everything, then you can have um, you know, closed loop automated system. And this is kind of what we're doing here, except that it's doing this around developers and not around machines. <laughs> but uh, this is, it's a similar kind of thing. Yeah, sorry, okay. I'll speak louder, thanks. Uh, there's, a, there's a link here you can now, so these slides are available as PDF. There's a link on the, um, um, on the page for this talk. And on this slide, seven, uh, there's also a link to um, a shared document that has a more detailed description of the pipeline design, modular pipeline. Uh, so this is like the theory. Now, in practice, what does that? Uh, how does that um, work? So, right now we have well, kernelci.org. There is one database that's being used. That's being used for a long time. But we have a new one using Google BigQuery, and the idea is to have to use that as a prototyping database, but with access to more uh, more testing systems. So, all the tests currently, uh, the test results currently available on kernelci.org are also sent to this database and uh, now we have also Red Hat submitting test results to it and we would like to see maybe other people so typically typically member companies would be the first ones maybe to contribute to that um, so we, we're kind of refining the database schema for like storing bill results and test results um, and the the first outcome we would want to have is have a unified test email report so based on all, all that collective data uh, we could then send an email, say for you know a stable branch release or something. Instead, of, I don't know if you've noticed on stable branch uh, mailing lists, on stable link mailing lists, you have a lot of test results from coming from different test systems. So that's one of the um, the targets of having a common um, upstream kernel test you know, test system is to have uh, to have only one report that's gathering all the data. So having this database is the first step. So if you look on the previous slide, that's basically the um, the um, the store bit, so yeah, store is artifacts and database, but this is at least the, the database part. Um, yeah, and then we can build kernels in different places, so that's, you know, the block block number two build, how do you build? Well, if, we, if you have different people providing different, like, cloud compute and different ways of doing it, if you're modular enough, then you can include them, so uh, that makes the project easier to, to scale. Um, and right now we're using Jenkins, but um, we've made it in, we've changed it in a way so that it can run anywhere. So you can run all the kernel CI steps in a in a terminal, and some people have tried also using it in GitLab already. Uh, so Kevin is not here. Kevin Hillman has done this in a as a GitLab CI way. So it's, he's using the kernel CI command line tools in his um, in a branch in a kernel branch. Uh, so automatically, when, the, when your new changes are being pushed to the branch, it uses GitLab CI to build and test things like in other GitLab CI projects. Uh, but this could be used in other test systems as well. Uh, and also abstracting the uh, lab API. So you know, test labs are where hardware is available to test kernels. Uh, so by default, we use Lava, which is you know the linear project for automating tests. Um, but it's not the I mean, there are plenty of other things. Um, so we've made an abstraction in, in the kernel CI 
cool tools so that it can submit things to uh, any lab. So right now it's only sending things to Lava, but we can send it to any, any other lab that has um, a web API uh, and can accept a test definition. So these are things we're working on. Um, so yeah, the development goals, um, a bit more specific. So the command line tools are like KCI BL to do a kernel, to reproduce a kernel CI BL from scratch. KCI tests are to generate test definitions. Um, so these are the, the things we're trying to Im improve so people, so they become more portable. Um, also we want to make it easier like I've said a bit before, to uh, make it easier for people to contribute tests. So if you're a maintainer or developer and you have a test, or maybe you work on a part of the kernel and you make some tests for it, it should be easy for you to enable this in kernel CI. And right now, this kind of um, uh, steep learning curve, if you want to do this at the moment, you need to, be, you need to know too much about the internals of kernel CI to be able to add a, add a test to the list. But that's one of the things we're trying to like, lower the bar, basically. Um, and we need some good interaction with that. So we need some collaboration from the people who make the test as well. So we, we started with like a key people to try to um, try to do that. Um, so maybe next year I'll come back and see. <laughs> maybe if you follow the project, you'll see maybe things will become easier. Uh, but right now it is not very easy. It's it's still a good thing. You know, if you have a test you really want it to be in kernel CI, you can send it to the mailing list or on IRC, on kernel CI on Freenode, or kernel CI groups.io uh, mailing list. Uh, or just on the on the subsystem mailing list, uh, people know about kernel CI. Now, uh, also, yeah, we're trying to improve the web dashboard. So I don't know if you've seen the current kernel CI dashboard, but here we're showing mostly uh, builds and boot results. It's not really there. There is a test tab, but it's not really good at showing test results. Um, because kernel CI was originally about building kernels, like a variety of different ARM dev configs. And then about boot testing, and it's still kind of stuck in that phase. Uh, so we've we're starting running tests, but the results are not shown properly on the web front end, on the web dashboard. So that's that's one thing we, we are fixing actually right now to unlock a lot of things. There's many tests that were kind of held back because maybe we could run them, and then email reports have some limitations. And if the front, if the web dashboard doesn't show all the results, then we, the tests kind of <laughs> get hidden, and that's that's a waste of resource. Um, but yeah, we still also need to improve the um, email reports. That's also um, a two-way process because it's hard to design something uh, from like from the beginning. It's more like you know sending email reports and seeing how people react to it and whether they, you know what is useful, what is not useful. And different subsystems or different mailing lists need different types of reports actually. Um, so the key message I guess here is we need feedback. <laughs> and if if the email you get is not perfect. Um, uh, often people say, if you send another one like that, I'll just you know put your <laughs> put a filter to put all your kernel CI emails in in spam or in junk, <laughs> something like that. Well, that's maybe yeah. If, <laughs> if it keeps get, getting bad all the time, but normally we try to like uh, improve things as we go. So uh, that's the, the, the key message is you know we can't get to perfect thing from from day one basically. Uh, and also a slightly more longer term project um, goal. Uh, is to improve uh, test bisection. So we have bisection for boot tests, uh, for you know, just plain boots at the moment. So like booting to a login, if you can log in, that's a boot. And that's very easy to bisect because it's only one pass-fail result per, per test, per run. Uh, but as we're running more test suites that have a lot of tests, uh, then it becomes harder to bisect things when you have different test cases, passing or failing at different rates. Uh, so that's, we, we have, um, I'll come back to this in, a, in another slide, but we have some, some, um, some ideas on how to do this as well. So reusable tools. Uh, yeah, so we have KCI build, KCI test, KCI rootfs, and there's, um, to, to create root file systems. There's um, a wiki page that might, that might be written in a, in a not too distant future, but right now there's a wiki page kind of work in progress that gives you at least a starting point if you want to start, if you want to see what these tools do. Um, we also have the interface to the BigQuery uh, database, so there's a command line tool to, for submitting kernel CI results to the common kernel CI. 
so if you have a test system and you want and you're testing the upstream kernel, you want to submit results, you can get in touch and use that tool and you know we can give you a token and then you submit your results. Uh, then also Docker containers. I haven't worked on it myself uh, recently, so I'm not an expert in the state of all of these, but I know that there's some good progress that has been done to have containers with a Lava instance with a, you know, Jenkins configured for kernel CI and the back end that's the, the back end currently used on kernelci.org with MongoDB and the front end which is here on kernelci.org. So there are containers to make it easy for someone to recreate the whole system uh, in their own environment. Uh, and again, if you try to find some issues, it's all on GitHub on the kernel CI project on GitHub. Um, but we need we need more people to use it <laughs> basically to get some uh, get some feedback on it. Um, so yeah, about advanced Py sections. So there's this, there's this tool I worked on called Scalpel, which is inspired by EasyBench, uh, which was written by Martin Perez at Intel. So we've been talking because he made this tool for um, for graphics testing. Uh, it's actually not really used in production easy bench at the moment, but there, it had a much, much more advanced bisection feature than the normal git uh, bisect command you have, because this can deal with different, well, several test cases at the same time, so when you run one test, you can provide the results for many test cases. It can also request tests to be run several times if they are not stable. Uh, so the Scalpel project is ba basically extracting this and boiling it down to a, a more portable thing that can be used. And as a, if you look at the project on uh, on, um, on this GitLab um, project, you can find there's a demo that will run, like create a Git history with like dummy pass fail things, and it will find a, find a problem in it. And it's kind of ready to be used in kernel CI, but uh, it will come a bit later, I think. But that, that I hope that will really help for some things. So people say maybe we should be testing patches as pe people send them because when you have <laughs> one patch on a mailing list you can test it on its own and you know if it's good or bad before it gets merged. And yes that's ideal but it means that there's a lot of patches. <laughs> so, uh, so adding, you know, supporting all of it and you know building, if you want to build all the kernel configs we build, or even a subset of that, say if you want to build 10 kernels for each patch that is sent and test it with 200 different uh, platforms, and you know, that, that doesn't scale very well, I think. So maybe in some cases, if we do it wisely, we can only test a subset based on which subsystem the patch was sent to, but that can take a lot of tweaking. Um, so the idea of the, the whole advantage of having bisection is when you test Linux Next, for example, where all the new patches that have been applied are merged together, and if something break, um, so if something breaks at this point, then you only need maybe ten iterations to to bisect from yesterday's next to today's next. Um, so you build ten kernels basically to find when when you know that there, are, there is actually a problem. So it can be very efficient. Uh, so that's why bisection is such an important thing for kernel CI. Uh, okay, so tests, wish lists. So these are the things that have been identified so far. But again, maybe some people would think that network keeps failing all the time. Other things maybe are also important to test. But these are kind of obvious things that are directly. So the yeah the, the ones at the top are the ones that kind of come with the kernel. Um, and we're not really doing them too well right now, but that's, uh, I think that's uh, like an obvious list of things we should be doing. Uh, Linux test project, I know that LTP that was mentioned a bit earlier, that's m at least some parts of it, because some parts may not be completely relevant to the kernel, maybe more like user space oriented, but there are definitely some things in there that we, that you would expect to be run on on a, on a kernel test system. And then some, some are more uh, subsystem centric, like, you know, for media subsystem, you have Visual 2 compliance and other things, and IGT and XFS tests. Um, these, there, there's a lot of them, <laughs> basically. Uh, and this is where more integration with, well, more communication with the subsystem maintainers and developers needs to happen. Uh, and that's basically the, like a summary of where we are, where we're trying to be, uh, where we're trying to go. Um, there's a lot more that can be said. It's a very big project. But it, and it's kind of old because it has been around for five years, but it's new at the same time because now we have a budget and we have some ideas. And we have a lot of limitations 
have been removed uh, since we've joined the Linux Foundation. So um, I'm, I'm hoping it's like a rebirth for the project. We need also some engagement for, from the people. We need people to realize that now, you know, this has been selected by, by the Linux kernel community basically as the main project for <coughs> testing, testing upstream. And you can reuse it for your, your own products as well. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is about the technologies used for uh, testing in general. So uh, there are many different things. So the tests that come with the kernel are normally written in C, like a self-test, or you have some shell scripts as well. Um, and, well, uh, the static analysis coccinelle is, is a separate language. Um, and KUnit is also written in, I mean, Cassian and, and the, these are like built-in things, so the kernel configs you enable, basically. <coughs> And KUnit is a bit the same. It's part of the kernel, so it's all written in C. Now, you can have, there are also some test suites. A lot of, basically, the quick answer is a lot of it is written in C because it talks to the kernel, so it does a lot of system calls, and it makes sense to have a low level. There's no high level language that the tests are described in a declarative form or anything. Sorry, to, so I can repeat. In, in other user space projects, we're testing users using a high-level language that, okay. that defines, the, declares the test, and then that is translated into okay. the native language okay. of the project. Yeah. But there is no such language for the kernel yet, is there? So the question is whether there's a high-level language to define the tests and then run them. So yeah, for, for example, the, uh, the test run in Lava, there's a YAML definition that explains what needs to be run. And then you will, have, you will have some commands there that might be binaries or maybe shell scripts or maybe Python. So it depends. Each test suite has a different way of being run. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you were second. Yeah. So for a single test run, uh, what's the average runtime and what, is, what would be considered like a reasonable runtime for a single uh, run test or test run? Okay, so the question is for one run, uh, for one test run, what is the um, usual run time and what's the expected time for that, basically? What would be reasonable? Yeah. What would be reasonable? Yeah, like half a day, maybe, but... <laughs> okay, so, uh, of course, each... So, the question can be answered in different ways. So, if you want to test everything, then you can add, you know, time, how long it takes. Of course, some things run in parallel, so it's going to be, like, until you get the whole result, it's going to be what, what takes the longest. That can also be done by splitting test suites into smaller things to run more in parallel. So there isn't a simple answer to that. But what is, exp what, is um, what is desirable, basically, from a time duration? I think it depends on where in the process you are, where in the um, kernel workflow you are. What, you know. So if you're, if you're sending a patch, for example, you want the result to be quick enough. If it's, um, if it's Linux Next, because there's a version every day, you expect to have the results maybe within like six hours. That wouldn't be too bad. Or maybe 12 hours even if it's running a lot of things. Uh, if it takes more than that, then you have more kernel versions to test than the times it takes to actually run the tests. If it's for uh, a stable release, maybe, maybe you can run more tests that will take two days and it will be valuable. So it depends on which version of the kernel at which stage you are in the development. The context of the, of the question is more like if you would like to use the Docker image and put it on, say, Travis CI and have it like pre version the limit, there's like 50 minutes for a single Docker run. So you basically would have to design things to work within the limitation unless you want to go for the paid version, let's say. <clears throat> okay, so the question was about integrating it in Travis CI to, uh, no, as an example. Comment. Yeah. So, so the, yeah. it's related to the question. Yeah. The idea is that if, if you want to run it in Travis CI as yeah. a Docker, yeah. then the limit is 50 minutes uh, okay. for the free version. So what you can do is uh, for, for a single Docker. Yeah. So then you have to split it up in, let's say, if, if it's uh, 500 minutes, but it's 10 Docker parallel, uh, divided into 10 Dockers running in parallel, let's say. Okay. Yeah. So it was a comment about if you wanted to integrate it in Travis CI with a limit to 50 minutes, basically you need to accommodate things around. You can also like build only one kernel version if you know the dev config, the architecture you care about. 
and then. Yeah. Does it even make sense to run things in Docker because you are not running the kernel you built, then, right? Uh, I guess, so the question is about, does it make sense to run Docker? You could use Docker to build a kernel and run things that will... Yeah. Docker is kind of good for you, right? You can use Docker to build a kernel, at least, yeah. so you have an environment to build it. Anyway, yes. Uh, yes. So how are tests being triggered? Do you need to submit them to kind of active activity, or do you scrape pull requests off the mailing list? Because I guess that's the eventual goal. Uh, so right now, there's a list of Git branches that are monitored every hour. So the question is, how are kernel CI tests triggered? And the answer is, right now, there's a list of Git branches that are being monitored. You can see them on, you know, on the website here. You have trees and branches. So all these are monitored every hour, um, and the system knows the last version that was tested. Um, and if there's a new version, then it triggers the whole thing, and it builds a bunch of tests. So pull requests, the master is the maintainer's trees. It's uh, even if one more even if one more commit was pushed to the branch, that's a different revision at the head of the branch, and that's enough. Now, like I said, also um, we've sh we've proved that it can work in a GitLab CI environment, where it's when you know a typical GitLab CI workflow, and that can trigger things as well. So you can reuse the same tools in a different setting if you want. To. Uh, I think maybe you were next, yeah, yeah. Time, and then okay. Okay, so two more questions, yeah. So question yeah. Okay, so uh, if you want to move to testing like uh, patches on the mailing list, how are we going to define which test suits to run? Because we are obviously going to want to run them all, but yeah. what if there is a patch to like memory management breaking file system or JVM? So the question is if... Yeah, yeah, but how, right? You, you, you need to look at the patch, right? It's been sent to test one mailing list, right? Yeah. So the question is, if we start testing patches, how do we determine which tests to run, basically? Um, so first you know which mailing list it was sent to, that, that, that could be a clue. And then, of course, you can do some stats on the, um, the files that it's touching. Um, and you can also, well, right now we have some. There are already tools that are analyzing the patches and looking at the files that are changing yeah. and trying to figure stuff out. I, I guess that's what the Red Hat kernel testing stuff does. So people are working on solutions. Um. But yeah, so we have a YAML-based configuration at the moment to, for each Git branch which test to run. We could have something like that for patches, so you know, depending on which mailing list it was sent, and maybe some people will care more about some things, like uh, you know, some maintainers will say, every time I push something, or well, maybe maintainers don't send that many patches, but you know, we could have any kind of arbitrary rules. To uh, I think there was a question here. Yeah, I was just wondering if it's also across like, arbitrary requests that you're monitoring. If we're monitoring across... Like, so we are, yeah, we're monitoring a lot of different branches. So the question is, can we, are we monitoring any random branches? So we're monitoring the main ones, of course, like mainline and next and stable, um, and we're doing as much testing as we can on them. Uh, then we're monitoring subsystem ones, uh, and we do a lot of testing, but maybe a bit less. And then the further away you are from the master, mainline master branch, the less testing you get, basically, so it scales in that way. So you could have an individual branch, you know, from like a maintainer or an individual developer. Uh, maybe if you have like only one or two kernel builds and you, don't, you do only a few tests on that, then it will, you know, for one Linux next, if you do 200 builds, that's like 200 people doing one build, basically. So that's the way it kind of scales. Uh, if the community think it's useful to have a branch, like when someone wants to have a branch added, they send a request, basically. If people think it's a good idea, and if you have enough build and test resources, then it can be added. As no, as long, well, the main rule is, I guess, that it needs to be upstream-oriented. So if, if it's a downstream branch for your own product, that's not something that would be on kernelci.org normally. Okay. Okay, so the question was about um, a generic um, way to talk to uh, labs. So right now, so there's, the, there's a command line tool called uh, KCI test. Um, if I show you, so basically it's about the, the bit when, when we have a build and you go to the run box, basically that's when you start to, start to test. So um, 
Right now we're using, so this command line tool, KCI test, is in Python, and there's uh, like an abstract class with some methods like, there's one like to generate a test definition, another one to submit a test definition, and we could add other things like receive the results. So right now the results are sent directly to the back end. Um, in some cases, we could like have the, um, the test lab send the result back to a place where KCI test would be used as well to receive the results and process it and store it in a database. So these are kind of the, the main primitive functions. And to really have it work in practice, we need to test it with more labs. Right now it's kind of only working with Lava, so it's still not very mature, but that's basically where it's going. So I think we've run out of time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you.